name is Josh Fate. I'm one of the regional directors for the Indiana Gear Up program, and I want to welcome you to our video tutorial series on beginning computer programming. And in this series, we're going to cover the programming language called Python. We chose this language for a couple of reasons, most of which is it's pretty high demand in the programming arena. It's used for many things and is very versatile. You can use it for simple things like automation scripts or creating simple mods for video games. You can use it in machine learning and artificial intelligence. You can use it in web development. You can even take Python and interface with the real world by using single board computers like the Raspberry Pi platform or even using microcontrollers to interface with sensors and mechanisms to use these things in the real world to make IoT things or even robotics. Another reason we chose Python is because it is very, very, very accessible for beginners. The language itself is written much like common language that you read, and it is also very, very well documented. It, all it usually takes to find an answer to a problem is a simple web search because so many people are using Python out in the real world. So what we're going to do is we're going to head back in, set up the computer, and let's take a look at some of this stuff. Okay, now that we're sitting behind the computer, let's talk about how we're going to interact with Python. Um, first thing we're going to do, and probably a little disappointing to you is we're actually not going to play with a lot, any code in this first video. We're really just going to work on setting up our environment and getting everything ready to learn how to code. Um, the first thing in that process is how do we set up our computer to do what we want to do? So there's going to be two different pathways. There's going to be one pathway if you have a real computer, and there's going to be another pathway if you have something that's a device that maybe doesn't have a full operating system, or at least not one of the traditional operating systems. To begin with, let's talk about if you have a computer that you have access to that has an operating system that is, is more fully featured. So that would be something like Windows or Mac OS or Linux or BSD or even something as obscure as AIX. Um, you can actually install the entire Python development environment on your computer, and actually you should. Um, and to do that, we're going to go to the website that you see right here. This is python.org. Uh, you want to make sure that it is .org. That is the actual official site of the Python programming language. And as you can see here, there's lots of things going on on this page, including a little code snippet right there on the front. But we're going to go straight to downloads. And if you look here, you can see that there's lots of different options. Um, you can even get source code. I wouldn't recommend that. I would just go for whatever option you have available. Mo more than likely, it's going to be Windows or Mac OS. That's usually what people have. Um, so you would just click there and download and install this on your computer. Um, if you have something that's a little more obscure, uh, we can go in here. You can go to this other platforms. And there's lots of different ways that you can download it for uh, different operating systems. But once we get that downloaded, we are going to have everything we need. That's going to be the programming language itself, all the documentation. It's also going to have IDLE, which is their integrated development environment, to be able to program. Now, that is if you have a real computer with an operating system. That may not be what a lot of us have. We may have a phone or a tablet or a Chromebook, something that doesn't have something as fully featured. So we're going to have to use a different way of going about this because we can't install Python on those. So what we're going to do is we're going to use another website. We are going to use this website called REPL.IT. Now, REPL is actually a term that comes from programming. It means read, eval, print, and loop. Um, Python has a REPL, so we'll talk about that when we get there. But basically, this is just a website that kind of has already done all that legwork for you. To be honest, if you didn't want to install things on your computer and you just wanted to play around this is a good place to do it. So for here, you can sign up and get an account. If you want to be able to save things, you definitely want to do that. Um, but for a lot of our stuff, you really don't have to. You can just go straight to the Start Coding button. Okay, and when you go here, it's going to have you create a new REPL, and you can pick a programming language. And you can see just from this scroll down right here, how many different programming languages that this will support. It's a ton of programming languages. But thankfully, Python's right at the top, and that's the one we need. So we're going to grab that, and then we'll create a REPL. Okay, once you get in here, there's lots of different things going on. It's kind of complicated to look at. Um, and that's one of the things that we're going to talk about is your development environment and the editor that you use. If you are using this site, this is your editor. And you can change lots of things about it. Uh, you can just play around. There's really nothing you can break. Uh, if you go down here to the settings, you can do all sorts of things. Uh, if you don't want it to be side by side, you could do a stacked layout like this, or you can do side by side. You can do a dark theme, which I prefer. I like dark themes. I think it's easier on my eyes. You can change your size of your font on everything. Uh, indent type spaces or tabs, we'll talk about that. That's a big debate. And key bindings, if you're used to something else, uh, they have e Emacs bindings and Vim bindings. You probably don't know what that means, uh, but by the end of this, you will. And then 
there's even more. Really, past that, I wouldn't really mess with anything. So this is the rebel.it environment. And if you don't have a device that you can install Python on, you really want to start here. Okay, so now we've kind of switched back to if you have a real computer. I know this is kind of confusing because we're going back and forth. Um, but what I've pulled up here is this is idle. This is the integrated development environment that Python comes standard with. And this works pretty much exactly the same as REPL.IT does. It gives you a place to type in commands and type in code and save it and run it and do all the things you want to do to be able to develop. Um, now, this is very sparse. It doesn't have a lot going on it, but everything you do in here, you can do in another editor. There's nothing, nothing separate about these things. It's usually just bells and whistles. That's the difference. Okay, and now I've switched over to another development environment. Now, this is Emacs. It's a text editor, just like we were talking about. And if you remember, the word Emacs was on REPL.IT. This is the uh, text editor that I use to code in. It's set up to be exactly what I want and when I want it, and I know everything about it. So it just sort of becomes your home. And you can see I've got a little program pulled up here in Python just to kind of have something to look at. But really, one of the things that I want you to get used to is not caring about the editor. One of the fantastic things about Python is that there are tons of tutorials, like billions probably of tutorials out there on how to do it. So when you run into a problem, it's very easy to go find some answers. And what will typically happen is you'll find a YouTube video or you'll find a blog and they'll have pictures or they'll have screen captures of them using whatever editor they use. You have to get past seeing the editor and look just at the code. So there will be times when I switch editors just to do it, just so you see something different and see how they work. But like I said, every one of them works essentially the same way. It's just bells and whistles that change. Um, like I said, this is my home. I love Emacs. That's where I live. Um, you may like Vim. You may like REPL.IT, and that's where you want to stay. Um, there are companies that use that as a full-fledged development environment for people. So there's nothing wrong with that. You just kind of gravitate towards what works for you. But the big thing is don't get stuck on just having one editor and if you see something different not being able to interpret what's going on you should be able to look at the code and know just from the code what's going on okay so there's one more thing to do before we get started working with code and this is going to be the last part of our setup um, this is probably going to be the most unpopular part but maybe the most essential and this is really going to be how we organize our learning one of the things that we've learned through a lot of research is that our brain, while it can store information, that's not what it's best at. It's actually better at processing information than storing it. So we need to figure out a way to store the information for our brain to process later. So I have a cute little term for this that I call my auxiliary brain. And this can take really any form you want. I will talk about what I think are some pros and cons of some of these ways to do this, but really you just need to have a way that works. So the first thing is, is make it whatever works for you. Some people handwriting is the way to go. There's actually a lot of research that shows that when you handwrite something, it goes into your brain better. Um, I, we will talk about that in a minute that I think that maybe that's not, there's some other benefits to typing that may be a little better. But for some people, and especially in the real world, when I'm not sitting at my computer, I'll use something like this, just a composition notebook that I put notes in that I may need to reference later. This is a place to store ideas. Next, you want to always have it around. And this is something that comes kind of from the tradition of being a technology person, a lot of times when you talk to somebody who's worked in the technology field, they have a little black book, which is a book they keep around and they always write down little tricks and stuff they learned that they can go back and look at. So whenever you're sitting down to do your coding, you probably want to have this auxiliary brain around in wherever you're doing it. Now, the next thing is write down everything. No matter how small it is, if you come up with a solution to a problem, you should probably write it down because you may encounter that problem again, and being able to reference back what you've already done will save you time and effort. Uh, you wind up doing a lot of the same things over and over and over again in programming, and if you already have the solution, there's no reason to recode it. Okay, now, this is where we're gonna get into sort of a cost-benefit analysis between handwriting things and keeping them in some sort of text file. Um, I prefer a plain text file, not like a Word document, although you could use that, but something that is just like a TXT file or some sort of parsable plain text. The reason I think that that's important is because it is parsable. You can search it. So if I, for example, figure out how to index multidimensional arrays and get a specific specific value out of multi dimensions, sounds like a lot of gobbledygook. It's a thing we're probably going to wind up doing. 
I don't need to look that up over and over and over again. If I have that solution, I figure it out, just write it down somewhere. Um, if I do it in a plain text format, I can search for it and it pops up. Just a quick keyword search and I can find it. Where if I have it in paper, I'll have to flip through a bunch of pages. Or even worse, if I didn't write it down, I may have my bookcase full of books on Python. And I have to go through and remember which book did that was that in and how do I find it. This way, you always have it. And it's going to make you more efficient and more valuable to people. A lot of times when it comes to programming, if you want to do this as a career, you want to be efficient. And so having sort of this little uh, auxiliary brain full of your ideas and your solutions to problems is great. And over time, you may look back at one of your old solutions and be and think, oh, I could do that better than now and rewrite your notes. That way, I think the plain text is better because it's editable. You can go back. You can even do things like crazy things like version control on it and stuff we'll talk about as we go on in this this little series. But I personally think plain text is the way to go. If you are somebody who loves to handwrite things and you want to put it in a book and save it somewhere, by all means, that's going to do most of what you want to do. But I think if you're just starting and you don't have a preference, I would tend to put it into a plain text format. Um, we'll talk about that. You'll see me do it as we go through these coding exercises. I will probably keep sort of start a new auxiliary brain and show you guys how I will do it and how I can do that inside my editor at the same time that I'm coding. That way, everything's right there when I need it. But really, that's the key. Just keep notes. Notes are important. I know notes are probably the most boring part of learning, but they're really important here because you're going to be doing so many different things very quickly in quick succession, and you want to be able to go back and look at them. And this is going to help you do that. So that's it for this lesson. Next time, we're actually going to start dissecting some code. And you should be able to write your first program after the next lesson. So I'll see you guys then.